Welcome to the third and final part of the airfoil selection video for the UWS-1 Ultralight from the Ultralight Airplane Workshop. My name is Leon. In part one of this video series for selecting the airfoil for the UWS-1 Ultralight, we talked about the criteria that we would use for selecting the airfoil. In part two, we started assigning some values to those criteria and then we used the XFLR software to compare a few airfoils that have been used on ultralights in the past. At the end, we looked at one particular airfoil that looked pretty promising. In this video, part three, we're going to look a little more at that airfoil, which had a little more drag than one we'd like. And we're going to see if we can improve it. What I decided to do was take a systematic approach to modifying this airfoil to get one that I think will work good at our coefficient of lift at cruise of 0.38. So I took our 30U615 airfoil, the one used on the Ultra Cruiser. I kept the thickness at 15% for all the airfoils, and then I started changing the percent cord where that maximum thickness is, the percent of camber, and the position of that max camber. So for the percent of the maximum thickness, I started at 25%, I did 30%, 35%, and that's as far as I went on that. On the camber, I started at 3%, and then I went up to 3.5%, 4 4.5%, and 5%. And then for the position of that maximum camber, I did 30%, 35%, 40%, 45%, and 50%. And you're not going to be able to see it very well. But you can hopefully see that there's quite a variation in airfoil shape when I did all those various combinations. Now let's go look at the graphs for coefficient of lift versus coefficient of drag. Now at the moment, you're not going to be able to see details on these lines, but you can see they kind of start looking similar down here, down around 3.8. I'm going to zoom in. Now once we get down to this level of zoom, you can see that if you think about it in percent, there's going to be quite a variation here. So the least drag is just barely underneath 0 0.005. The one with the most drag is probably 0 0.008 or 0 0.0085, somewhere around in there. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through and I'm going to remove all of the airfoil shapes that are pretty high down here at 0.38 and some of them that kind of transition just a little bit higher. And we're going to try to figure out if we can understand what qualities of the airfoil give us a good coefficient of drag down here around the coefficient of lift that we want. I've now gone through and removed the airfoils that had the worst drag. And here again, we have our coefficient of lift versus coefficient of drag plot. And I left the one of the worst ones in here, which is this airfoil here. And one of the things to mention is the software that estimates coefficient of drag is notorious for doing a poor job of calculating coefficient of drag up near and past the stall speed. But, and that would be this area up here. But we're not really worried about that. We're more interested down here near our cruise speed, which would be down here at the 0.38 coefficient of lift. So let's zoom in on there and see what we've got. So our 0.38 is roughly in this area. And this is, again is our worst drag of all the various airfoils that we came up with. It's kind of interesting to look at which series of airfoils came out to be pretty good. Now let me explain the naming nomenclature that I have on these airfoils. The airfoil that all these were derived from was the Harry Riblet GA30U615. And then these numbers here represent how I've modified them. All of them have a 15% thick airfoil, which is this 15, the A represents at. These next two digits are the percent cord where that maximum thickness is. So in this case, it's 35%. So all of these 
airfoils, except for this one, are a 35% cord maximum thickness airfoil. So I find that to be very interesting. Although that should not be too surprising since we know with laminar flow airfoils, the farther back along the cord your maximum thickness is, the lower your drag will be. So it's very likely that we are getting a little bit of laminar flow on these airfoils, even though we have a fairly large radius on the nose. This next set of digits is the maximum camber, and the decimal would be between the two digits. So for example, this one is a 3% camber. And then the next two digits, or the A is the at, and the next two digits is also the percent chord where that maximum camber occurs. Now, as you can see, we actually have quite a range here of where that maximum camber can occur. Anywhere from 30% up to, there's a 50%. Let's take a look at what that worst case was, and unfortunately the software likes to overwrite some of these, but this worst case was at 25% cord for the maximum thickness, so pretty far in front of this 35%, and roughly a 3.5% camber at 30% of the cord. But moving that maximum thickness forward seems to have caused quite a bit of drag. Now let's look at it a little more. Let's go look at coefficient of moment. Now here's our coefficient of moment. Now I mentioned before we really don't want a coefficient of moment that goes greater than zero. So that means all of these airfoils where it went greater than zero we really don't want to use. So that really only leaves us three airfoils. This blue one goes right up to zero. And this green one has a fairly significant coefficient of moment when we're in the cruise area. So that kind of makes it less desirable. So for now, let's get rid of everything but this dashed purple, this dashed blue, and this green airfoil because I don't want any of these. Well, now I've gotten rid of all those airfoils that had a coefficient of moment near the stall above zero. And I left this green one just as an interesting comparison when we go back to the coefficient of lift versus coefficient of drag plot. Now just based on what we're looking at here, I would prefer this pinkish line because it's a little bit more below zero at the stall for coefficient of moment. It's likely that any of these three would be perfectly good airfoils. And in fact, this one that I have marked as a loser airfoil would, pro would be perfectly fine too. Going to uh, all this analysis that I'm doing is really kind of splitting hairs, but it's a procedure you could go through to try to analyze airfoils. And as I mentioned before, these software programs aren't very good at accurately predicting our coefficients when we're near the stall speed. So these could be fairly far off. They might be way down here or they could be positive. But for now I'm just going to go with what the software is showing me. At least relative to each other, I think the software is probably fairly reliable. It's just the absolute value that's probably not accurate. Well let's go back now to the coefficient of drag plot. And this is still zoomed in. Okay, this is kind of interesting. That makes me think that this pink one may not be what I want because it's starting to go into drag right around my 0.38. The blue one waits a little bit longer before it goes into drag, just a little bit lower. Although its drag as I'm climbing is a little bit more. The pink one would be slightly better in climbing. And this green one that I just kind of kept around its drag is lower way up here at the 0.55 coefficient of lift. So we'd actually, if we were climbing it, we'd be better, but I expect we'll be cruising at about 0.38. So I think either one of these pink ones or blue ones will work. I think I will probably go ahead and go with the pink one. I do want to point something out here. If we were building a sheet metal plane with rivets or if we were building a wooden wing that was fabric covered. These differences that I'm looking at here on these airfoils 
wouldn't matter. We couldn't build the airfoil accurate enough to take any advantage of these very slight differences we're seeing in these airfoils. There's just too much variation on those kinds of airplanes to make a difference. But on a composite airplane, as long as you can build the service accurately, at least there's the potential to be able to take advantage of these very slight differences that we're measuring here. Well, I wasn't real happy with either one of these pink or blue dashed lines, so I decided to split the difference. I created another airfoil where everything's identical except for the position of the maximum camber, and I split the difference between 40% and 44% and put it at 42. That'll be this yellow line over here. So as you can see, we go from when we start getting turbulent on the bottom side, is kind of halfway in between this pink one and the blue one. And the drag up in here in the climb area is also kind of halfway in between. But it's kind of coincidentally, it actually has just a smidgen less drag than either one of them right at our cruise coefficient of lift. Like I said before, I think any of these airfoils would work just fine. I'm really just kind of playing here with the software to try to kind of get an idea of how the performance of the airfoils change as you change these values over here. That's really all I'm playing with. Let's go back and check coefficient a moment. There we go. So our yellow line is still below zero up here when we're at the stall. I mentioned I wanted to play around a little bit with the thickness of the airfoil to see what would happen there. So what I've done is I've taken this yellow airfoil and I've gone back and modified it to have a 13% thickness and a 17% thickness. This white line is the 17% thickness. This brownish line is the 13% thickness. So as you can see, increasing the thickness really increased the drag a lot. Decreasing that thickness it decreased the drag a little bit, but not a whole lot. Now you can also see that where we start getting turbulent, the location of the coefficient lift where that happens has moved up. So let's say I wanted to go with this 13% thick airfoil. I really would like to move that down here because the 13% thick airfoil down here where our coefficient lift of drag is at 0.38, is way more than the airfoil we had selected. So we'd have to go through the process again of playing around with the camber, location of the camber, and location of maximum thickness to see if we could move this knee down a little bit lower. Let's take a quick look at coefficient of moment. Now I noticed as it was doing a calculation on the thicker airfoil, the software could not converge on a solution as the angle of attack increased. So we are not getting a good value for that angle of attack up here. Now a 13% thick airflow, which is this kind of brownish one, it has a little more coefficient of moment at stall and it has a little bit more at cruise, but not significantly more. But as I said, if we played around with the numbers over here to move that drag knee down a little bit farther, it's likely that the coefficient of moment would decrease a little bit and move up closer to where this yellow one is. I just couldn't help myself and I had to decide if I could make that 13% thick airfoil to see if I could move its drag knee down a little bit. And this light blue line is the newest airfoil that I came up with for a 13% thick. So the way I drug this knee down, I decreased the camber from 3.5% to 3.3%. Now one of the things that it did though was it had moved my coefficient of moment up above zero near stall and I didn't like that. So to try to counteract that then, I moved the position the maximum camber from 42% of the cord back a little bit to 44% of the cord and that increased my coefficient of moment a little bit. So I was able to get this knee down to the same place of the 15% airfoil. So it just kind of shows the way you can just tweak the numbers around a little bit and get the airfoil to perform the way you want it to. But for now, 
until I can get to the structural design of the airplane and figure out if I can do the 13% thick airfoil, I'm going to stick with the 15% thick airfoil. Well, we have a tentative airfoil for the UWS-1 Ultralight now. This is not the final word on what the airfoil will be for the Ultralight. I do need to do a little bit more testing. I want to test this aerofoil at different Reynolds numbers. The Reynolds number at the root of the wing will be different than the Reynolds number out at the tip. So I'd like to do a little bit more work on that. So I hope no one takes the work that I did in this video as the final word for what a good aerofoil would be for an ultralight. It's just a possibility at this point. In the future, I may figure out that it's not such a good airfoil. It may have a significant problem. In fact, it could have a problem if I make a change to the wing that I'm thinking about. I'm giving some consideration to reducing the size of the wing, the surface area of the wing. And that's because I have a little bit of margin left in the coefficient of lift at stall for the wing. I calculated that I need a second coefficient of around 2.3 to 2.4 in that area. I should be able to get 2.5 to 2.6 using slotted flaps, using a simple hinge instead of the complicated movement mechanism that airplanes like jetliners use. So if I can reduce the surface area of the wing, that should allow me to make the wing a little bit lighter, and it should allow the wing to fly at a slightly higher coefficient of lift at cruise. That'll give me a few more airfoils that I can look at with the XFLR software just to see if we can gain just a little more drag reduction. But I doubt that we can. Well, what are the next things we should think about on our design for the UWS-1 Ultralight? One of the things we need to do is calculate the mean aerodynamic cord. That will then allow us to calculate the moment of the wing. And once we have the moment of the wing, we should be able to calculate the total moment of the airplane. And that will allow us to calculate the horizontal tail, surface area, cord, airfoil, etc. But before we do that, I'm going to get back into the shop and we're going to do some more vacuum resin infusion testing on some carbon fiber samples. If you're enjoying these design videos and the carbon fiber videos, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and click on that bell and you'll get notified when these videos go up on YouTube.